Well, good evening, everybody. Let me start by uh, thanking Foreign Minister Steinmeier and the people of Germany for hosting uh, this important meeting of the International Serious Support Group on the margins of the Munich uh, Security Conference. And we're very grateful to our colleague, Frank Walter, uh, for his uh, uh, help and assistance in this process and, and his participation as a member of the ISSG. I uh, also want to thank uh, all the member countries that understood the importance of our meeting here today. Uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi flew all the way from China. Uh, we had a uh, strong presence of all the ministers uh, because everybody understood the importance of this particular moment with respect to Syria. Last fall, the International Syria Support Group came together out of a shared sense of responsibility for the nightmare that the Syrian people have been enduring for far too long. And in December, we agreed on a set of commitments, unanimously endorsed by the UN Security Council, aimed at bringing an end to the war. Obviously, it's been difficult. Everybody understands that. That effort at the UN led to specific UN-sponsored negotiations uh, between the Syrian parties, which began under the stewardship of uh, UN envoy Stefan de Mistura and the UN itself. And everybody knows that uh, as the situation on the ground in, in Syria grew steadily worse, uh, the talks themselves became uh, wrapped up in the level of violence and in concerns that people had about negotiating under difficult circumstances. <coughs> Stefan uh, de Mistura wisely at that moment, after conversing with both sides in what were always scheduled to be proximity talks, then delayed this process knowing that we were meeting here in Munich uh, yesterday and part of this morning. Uh, during this time, the perception of many members was that the uh, regime of Bashar al-Assad was uh, violating international law by trying to force surrender through starvation. And with the help of indiscriminate bombing, the regime intensified its assault in Aleppo, killing civilians and forcing more than 60,000 Syrians to flee their homes in search of refuge across the Turkish border. And it is our perception that rather than hurting Daesh, this process has in fact empowered Daesh to take advantage of the chaos. UN Special Envoy de Mistura, who convened those talks, uh, agreed that we should come here uh, to Munich in order to allow the ISSG nations and the parties themselves to try to make the necessary progress to bring about humanitarian access that is urgently needed on the ground and in trying to implement a ceasefire on both sides. Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov worked closely with me and with the rest of the members today. <coughs> Uh, and I'm pleased to say that as a result, today in Munich, we believe we have made progress on both the humanitarian front and the cessation of hostilities front. And these two fronts, this progress, has the potential <coughs> fully implemented, fully followed through on, to be able to change the daily lives of the Syrian people. First, we have agreed to accelerate and expand the delivery of humanitarian aid beginning immediately. Sustained delivery will begin this week. First, to the areas where it is most urgently needed, Deir Ezzur, Fuad, Kafreya, the besieged areas of rural Damascus, Madaya, Muthimiya, Kafir Batna, and then to all the people in need throughout the country 
particularly in the besieged or hard to reach areas, the, the smaller neighborhoods and towns. This access is specifically called for in UN Security Council Resolution 2254 and to ensure that it is fully implemented. The United Nations will convene a task force made up of members of the ISSG and of relevant UN entities and of countries that have an influence on the parties particularly. And this working group will meet tomorrow in Geneva. It will ensure that humanitarian access is granted by all sides to all people who require help. And it will meet, as I said, for the first time tomorrow. It will report weekly on progress or lack thereof to help ensure a consistent and timely and approved access moving forward. I will say that it was unanimous. Everybody today agreed on the urgency of humanitarian access. And what we have here are words on paper. What we need to see in the next few days are actions on the ground in the field. And Stefan will speak to that. In addition, the ISSG members will work together with the Syrian parties to ensure the immediate approval and the completion of all pending UN access requests. As everybody knows, there have been about 114 of them, only 13 or so, 14 approved, uh, and that has to change. Second, we have agreed to implement a nationwide cessation of hostilities to begin in a target of one week's time. That's ambitious, but everybody is determined to move as rapidly as possible to try to achieve this. This will apply to any and all parties in Syria, with the exception of the terrorist organizations Daesh and al-Nusra and any other terrorist organization designated by the Security Council. To that end, we have also established uh, a task force under the auspices of the UN and co-chaired by Russia and the United States. And over the coming week, this group will work to develop the modalities for a long-term, comprehensive, and durable cessation of violence of hostilities. We will begin to exercise our influence by the commitment of every country at the table immediately for a significant reduction in violence as we work towards the full cessation of hostilities. Now, I want to underscore, uh, putting an end to the violence and the bloodshed is obviously essential, as is providing Syrians who are starving the humanitarian aid that they desperately need. But ultimately, the end of this conflict will only come when the parties agree on a plan for a political transition in accordance with the Geneva Communique of 2012. And we have no illusions about how difficult that is. No one here is, you know, following some pipe dream in this effort. People fully understand that compromise will be necessary that it will be essential to resolve very tough issues that are outstanding. But <coughs> without a political transition, uh, it is not possible to achieve peace. Today, all ISSG members agree that the Geneva talks should resume as soon as possible, and they should resume in strict compliance with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. And the ISSG also pledges all of us to take every single measure we can to facilitate progress within the negotiations. In December, we agreed on a six-month time frame for the political transition process. And today, we reaffirmed our commitment to that timeline. <coughs> we approach this, I think, with a uniform belief that the killing and the starvation of innocent people needs to end as soon as possible. Now, obviously, and just in closing, I'll say, you know, our hard work is obviously far from over. But our work today 
while it has produced commitments on paper, uh, I want to restate the real test is clearly whether or not all the parties honor those commitments and implement them in reality. What I've said again and again is we cannot guarantee success in the outcome. What the diplomatic process can guarantee is that we exhaust the possibilities of diplomacy and that we make every best effort to try to produce a platform on which the parties themselves can determine their future. Uh, that is what we're trying to do here. The longer this conflict persists, the better it is for extremists. The more people like Daesh profit and they have found a safe haven in war-torn <clears throat> Syria, and we are determined that we're going to continue and upgrade and increase our efforts to degrade and destroy Daesh as fast as possible. I am hopeful that the progress we're making here will be real, uh, that we'll be able to see this uh, reduction in violence, uh, which everybody accepted as a fundamental organizing principle of this effort, and that within this week uh, we can get the modalities secured for the cooperation necessary uh, to be able to produce a ceasefire. We also agreed in the ISSG that there's no way to institute a ceasefire effectively and no way to produce the access we want for humanitarian assistance without all of the ISSG members working with Russia and others in an effort to guarantee that the access is provided and that the cessation of hostilities actually takes hold. And to that end, we have agreed, all of us, to work with Russia in a way that deals with the political, the humanitarian, and the military components of this challenge. Sergey. Уважаемые дамы и господа, в дополнение к тому, что сказал Джон, хочу, во-первых, присоединиться к словам признательности в адрес наших германских хозяев, поблагодарить команду ООН за те усилия, которые они прилагали. Встреча была своевременной, потому что нас тревожила та серия проблем, которые возникла с выполнением договоренностей, достигнутых на предыдущих наших встречах. И главным итогом сегодняшнего заседания я считаю безусловное подтверждение резолюции 2254 во всей ее полноте. Это касается и гуманитарных аспектов, и политического процесса, и борьбы с терроризмом, и вопросов прекращения огня, за исключением, конечно же, террористических организаций, которые в качестве таковых признаны Советом Безопасности Организации Объединенных Наций. Мы рассмотрели все проблемы, которые пока тормозят выполнение резолюции. Джон сказал о некоторых из них. Особое внимание по понятным причинам мы уделили гуманитарной ситуации, которая ухудшается и до решения которой как, собственно, для выполнения всех других наших договоренностей необходима по-настоящему совместная работа, коллективная работа, за которую мы выступаем с самого начала нашей военно-воздушной операции в Сирии и к пониманию необходимости, которые все больше и больше приходят наши партнеры, нас это радует. По гуманитарным проблемам мы довольны тем, что сегодня удалось договориться о принципов их разрешения, о том, что доступ будет обеспечен по всей территории Сирии, во все без исключения осажденные районы, делаться это будет в комплексе, чтобы никого не дискриминировать и не решать проблемы одной части Сирии за счет игнорирования других проблем в других районах этой страны. Нас тревожило. В частности, то, что предыдущие усилия Организации Объединенных Наций, когда подобные решения прорабатывались вместе с правительством и с оппозицией, очень часто скрывались в последнего. 
at the folds of the letter. John mentioned Madaya, Fua, Kafraya. At these three населенные areas, he has been working for a long time, working with the Red Cross, 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 working когда мы записали необходимость комплексного решения всех этих проблем, я надеюсь, что и у оппозиции, и у тех, кто контролирует эти различные группы, не будет больше причин для того, чтобы отмыливать от своих обязательств. Мы, как сказал Джон, договорились создать целевую группу. Она встретится уже завтра в Женеве и будет работать регулярно под сопредседательством России и Соединенных Штатов с участием экспертов, и цель этой группы помогать организации Объединенных Наций и другим гуманитарным агентствам выполнять их обязательства перед гражданским населением. Разработан механизм, который позволит объективно рассматривать возникающие сложности и находить быстрое решение соответствующих ситуаций. Мы будем как и записан в сегодняшних документах, работать с правительством, работать с другими оппозиционными группировками, которые имеют контакты с нами, и рассчитываем, что и Соединенные Штаты, и страны региона, другие участники международной поддержки Сирии будут использовать свое влияние на соответствующие оппозиционные группы, с тем, чтобы они в полной мере сотрудничали с организацией Объединенных У нас есть общая решимость помочь облегчить страдания сирийского народа, и мы надеемся, что это будет сделано. Это особенно важно с учетом того, что некоторые из последних мероприятий по решению гуманитарных проблем в Сирии касались только беженцев и не затрагивали судьбу огромного количества внутренних перемещенных. Поэтому у нас есть основания надеяться, что мы сегодня сделали полезные дела, и что оно воплотится в практический момент. Мы приветствуем готовность Соединенных Штатов и других стран присоединиться к операциям, которые российская сторона вместе с сирийским правительством проводит по десантизму гуманитарной помощи с самолетов в Дейр-Зор, где самое большое количество гражданских лиц находится в посадном положении. Договорились также использовать парашютирование гуманитарной помощи и в отдельных других районах, где ситуация позволяет это сделать. Но основную часть усилий, конечно, придется прилагать на земле. Второе, что является важным достижением сегодняшней встречи, это вопросы прекращения огня и в качестве первого шага прекращения вооруженного противостояния. Это непростая задача. Слишком много игроков участвуют в военных Важно использовать уникальный потенциал международных сирий, который объединяет практически все страны, так или иначе влияющие на воюющие стороны на Мы договорились за неделю подготовить модальности, которые будут определять режим прекращения вооруженных действий, исходя из того, что за это время 
и правительство Сирии, и оппозиционные группы смогут принять необходимые меры для подготовки к прекращению вооруженных действий, а модальности будут разрабатываться еще одной целевой группой, которую мы также сегодня создали, как сказал Джон, которая будет работать под сопредстоятельством также России и Соединенных Штатов Америки. В ее состав будут входить и дипломаты, и военные, без которых очень трудно решать практические вопросы. Extremely difficult to deal with practical issues. Модальности, которые предстоит разработать, важны. И также хочу выделить договоренность о том, что мандат этой целевой группы будет включать в частности определение общих подходов в отношении тех территорий, которые находятся под контролем ИГИЛ, Джабхат-Ан-Нусра и прочих террористических группировок, которые квалифицированы в качестве таковых Советом Безопасности ООН. Мы, наверное, вы знаете, имели все эти месяцы достаточно такую эмоциональную дискуссию о том, кто наносит удары по правильным целям, кто наносит удары по неправильным целям. Мы многократно предлагали профессионально заниматься этим вопросом. Теперь, с договоренностью о том, что целевая группа будет определять в том числе и районы, которые занимают ИГИЛ и НУСРА и другие террористы, Daesh and Jabhat al-Nusra, we have made a very important practical step forward in this direction. I would also like to underscore that for the first time in our work, the document that we have adopted today stipulates the need to cooperate and coordinate not only political and humanitarian issues, but also the military dimension of the Syrian crisis. This is a qualitatively new change in the approaches, and we welcome it. We've been calling for it. Another important thing is the clear confirmation in today's document of the need to fully implement UN Security Council resolutions which require to потоки террористов, боевиков из иностранных государств, прекратить нелегальную торговлю нефтью и прочие контрабандой. И это важное напоминание, потому что резолюция Совета Безопасности необходимо выполнять в полном объеме. Подчеркнуто и задача возобновления переговорного процесса, который был приостановлен в условиях, когда Часть оппозиции заняла, я бы сказал, совершенно неконструктивную позицию и пыталась выдвигать предварительные условия. Мы записали, что переговоры должны возобновиться как можно скорее в строгом соответствии с резолюцией 2254, то есть без каких-либо ультиматумов, без каких-либо предварительных условий, и переговоры должны включать в себя широкий, a wide range of opposition forces, as you know, not all of real members of the opposition, some groups of the Syrian population have received an invitation to these talks. I believe that the UN will, as we have confirmed today, be strictly guided by principles stipulated by the UN Security Council Resolution 2254. The last thing I wanted to say is to support what John concluded his speech by, that the real test of our efforts will be our ability to respect our commitments and to implement what we have agreed upon. This is unfortunately a problem возникающие в контексте сирийского кризиса, мы постоянно сталкиваемся с недоговороспособностью некоторых наших партнеров. I have already mentioned the attempts to misinterpret the resolution 2254. We have been facing similar approaches when we are looking at how UN Security Council resolutions have been implemented that set forth a package of measures to settle the Ukrainian crisis. And I'm not going to mention the issue of Palestine. 
научиться не просто достигать компромиссов, но и выполнять те договоренности, которые в таких компромиссах закреплены. Когда происходит попытка, когда случаются попытки по достижению договоренности, начинать искать причины, которые оправдывают невыполнение одной из сторон принятых решений, это не приносит пользу делу, и повторюсь, я с полностью согласен с Джоном, что настоящее испытание на прочность будет то, как мы выполним то, о чем сегодня договорились в полном объеме, а не только в тех компонентах, которые удобны кому-то одному или одной группе из числа участников международной группы поддержки СИИ. Мы также сегодня договорились, что наша группа будет продолжать венский процесс. Проблем меньше не становится. Если удастся добиться прогресса на тех направлениях, о которых сегодня договорились, я думаю, это поможет нам решать и другие задачи, вытекающие из резолюции 2254. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when uh, we were convening and we had uh, the beginning of uh, the Geneva intra-Syrian talks, we were flooded, flooded with messages from the Syrian people. They were coming from all over, outside and inside Syria, and they were asking two things, actually three. The first one was, please don't have another conference as the others and don't have just a conference about talking about talks, but please give us two things. One is humanitarian access. We are human beings. We deserve to get food, water, access to medical facilities. And second, we need no more bombs, no more war. If you succeed in giving us that message, we will believe in you when you convene and reconvene the talks. I think that today the ISSG, which was actually convened in order to be able to give new energy to the future talks, has addressed that. Of course, that will be tested. Now, there are two aspects you heard. One is the humanitarian one. You can see here, and you have a list, and you will see it everywhere now. This is the list of the areas and the people who are in need, and the numbers of them. Now, the ISSG has told us, told the UN, you are in charge in launching this initiative with our support. We are going to do it tomorrow. We will have the first task force on, of ISSG, which means it's not meeting every two months. Now there is having a constant convening possibility in order to test seven locations. One of them, the Azur, which can only be reached by airdropping, others which have never been reached before. We will test it very soon, the Monday, Tuesday, not later, and see whether, in fact, we will have problems, as we often have had, in order to reach places. If that is the case, we go back to you again. And we will go back to the ISSG and say, we are needing help in order to make it happen. The other area, of course, is the one you heard about cessation of hostilities. Not ceasefire, we are talking about cessation of hostility, which is easier in a way and much more effective in a way because it requires just a decision. That is quite a challenge, quite a challenge for doing it in such a short period, but that's exactly what people are asking. And we will be, of course, assisting, but that is something that uh, the two convener countries are going to be committing themselves to make it happen. What I can say is that um, this is a good testing time are the Syrian people going to see these outcomes? Then they will believe in future conferences and they believe in their own future. And the ISSG has shown that they are re ready to commit themselves. One point that probably we noticed, many had wondered whether there was tensions in the region that would not allow some countries perhaps to be part of it or not wanting to be part of it. We were able today to witness exactly the contrary. 
Saudi Arabia was there, Iran was there, everyone was there, and they were there determined to spend hours in order to discuss it. So, thank you. So, then, thank you very much. We'll take uh, three questions tonight. The first one from David Sanger, New York Times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first, a definitional issue. If uh, any of you could just tell us a little more about how a ceasefire differs from the cessation of hostilities, I think we'd be uh, appreciative. Um, Mr. Secretary, the, the Russian airstrikes in the past few weeks, as you've mentioned, um, have strengthened uh, President Assad and his allies. Uh, it's given them virtual control of Aleppo for the first time in four years. So if this cessation of hostilities and ultimately a ceasefire works, aren't you essentially freezing a situation that effectively gives Mr. Assad a good-sized lump Syrian state, um, years after President Obama said uh, that he had to leave office? And Mr. Lavrov, could you address the humanitarian agencies who are all saying that your airstrikes are killing civilians each day, and yet your own government saying that they are not? Uh, are the humanitarian agencies lying about this? So uh, a ceasefire has a great many legal prerogatives and requirements. Uh, a cessation of hostilities does not, is not anticipated to, um, but in many ways they have a similar effect. A ceasefire in the minds of many of the participants in this particular moment uh, connotes uh, something far more permanent and uh, far more reflective of sort of an end of conflict, if you will, and it is distinctly not that. This is a pause that is dependent on the process going forward, and therefore cessation of hostilities is a much more appropriate uh, apt term. But the effect of ending hostile actions, the effect of ending <coughs> offensive actions, and permitting only defensive actions that are a matter of self-defense, is the same in that regard. Uh, I might comment also, and I think this is very important for everybody to understand. Uh, during this week, uh, the Assad regime and the opposition need to make their decision. And the, both are engaged, going to be engaged in consultations. Um, the International Syria Support Group took a different step this time from what has happened previously. In Vienna, on two occasions, and in New York, we called for a ceasefire. We encouraged people. Today, we specifically decided on a process, on a time frame, and we all agreed to do everything that we can to meet that. So the ISSG is engaged actively in the implementation process of this ceasefire through two task forces, one working on the humanitarian delivery, the other working directly on the modalities of the cessation of hostilities. And we will work on that. Uh, Sergey and I are chairing the ceasefire component, the ceasefire ultimately, not at this moment, but the objective is to achieve a durable, long-term ceasefire at some point in time. Now, that will only become possible if the parties themselves engage at the table in a genuine negotiation to implement what we have once again embraced, which is the Geneva process, uh, the Geneva communique that calls for a transition <coughs> by mutual consent with full executive authority. Now, look. We're doing everything in the power of diplomacy to try to bring an end to this conflict in a way that results in a unified, non-sectarian, minority-protecting, secular, whole state. That's a complicated <clears throat> task. Uh, and there are many different cross-currents underneath this that make it complicated. 
But we're convinced that that's the only way that Syria really survives and can flourish again, uh, and that you can make peace. Obviously, there is a difference, which has to be worked out in the context of the negotiations regarding the future of Assad. Uh, and you have to be at the table to deal with that. It doesn't do any good for me to sit here or Sergey or other people to, you know, go on and on about what he has or hasn't done. In the end, that's got to be resolved in the context of the negotiation or through uh, you know, some other leverage. With respect to uh, freezing uh, the current situation, if you will, uh, in this sort of rump state, I, I, I disagree completely. Uh, yes, it is true that the bombing of the last weeks and the aggressive actions of the Assad regime together with the forces from other places and countries that have helped them has made a difference for Assad. There is no question about that. But that difference doesn't end the war. That difference does not mean that Assad is secure or safe for the long term. It does not mean that Syria is free from the scourge of terrorist activity by Daesh and others, al-Nusra and others. And it does not mean that the war is able to end at any time in the foreseeable future. So while, yes, there are some advantages, they are not advantages that turn this on its ear. This is still a very complicated conflict with long-term implications, with increasing levels of violence, with increasing numbers of refugees, with increasing numbers of terrorists. And it is our belief that the more successful Assad is in securing territory against the opposition, the more successful he is in creating more terrorists who threaten the region. So we have a fundamental task ahead of us, which hopefully this process can shed some light on as to how we are going to be able to resolve the conflict of one war, which is the war against Assad, and also resolve the other war, which is the war against the terrorists, and particularly Daesh. And no small undertaking, but very much front and center in all of our thinking and in the political process that we are trying to create to find a peaceful resolution. As for the issue, as for the question that you've asked me, the difference between ceasefire and cessation of hostilities Resolution 2254 talks about the ceasefire only. This term is not liked by some members of the International Syria Support Group. What I'm referring to is how something that has been agreed upon should be implemented rather than try to remake the consensus that has been achieved in order to get some unilateral advantages. We have agreed to this because it is said clearly that this is the first step towards the ceasefire. John has explained that there isn't much difference, actually, but this this play in words is the same thing as statements about the existence of some kind of plan B, statements that ground forces should be prepared. This is a slippery road. They say that it is necessary for, to defeat ISIL, but there is no doubt that this will only lead to the aggravation of the conflict. However, given that many countries, especially the U.S., have the so-called Assad issue, and this Assad issue is still in the center of their attention, although we have said clearly in the UN Security Council resolution and repeated today that only the Syrian people themselves will determine 
will decide the fate of Syria, and the political process should be carried out on the basis of mutual consent of the government and the whole range of opposition. We've said a lot about Aleppo today. And we've heard accusations against Russia, which I'm not going to repeat. We hear them on a daily basis. You've mentioned some kind of humanitarian agencies, which, as you've said, keep saying every day that Russia kills civilians. I did not hear such statements from humanitarian agencies of the UN. That is why I cannot say that they are lying. But some do lie. I know that the well-respected media, I'm afraid that I, might be, that I might make a mistake. I, I believe this is a British media that took an interview from Ban Ki-moon and published this interview with unscrupulous versions of what is said. He never mentioned Russia. Russia. He just called for the end of any actions that lead to sufferings uh, of civilians. The interviewer allowed himself to put into the mouth of the UN Secretary General these statements that he was saying all those things about Russia. So yes, there are lies, but these are not the humanitarian agencies that are lying. We are cooperating with humanitarian agencies and they, by the way, if you talk to them, and if they are not put under pressure, they will acknowledge that cooperation in dealing with humanitarian issues from the government is much more constructive than that from the side of opposition. Well, you see, many are simply trying now to not to create the impression that they are beyond the mainstream that is now being created in media, trying to distract attention from what is the important for all of us. And the most important for all of us is to prevent ISIL from implementing its criminal plans, and they are trying to limit it by the change of regime, as if Iraq and Libya had never existed, the case of Iraq and Libya had never existed. Some still have illusions that if we change the regime, everything will be fine. As for Aleppo, John said that he is worried by recent aggressive actions of well, the government. Города, well, if liberation of the city that has been taken by illegal armed groups can be qualified no, as aggression, then, well, yeah, probably. But to attack those who have taken your land is necessary, is a necessary thing. First of all, this has been done by Jabhat al-Nusra, and also western suburbs of Aleppo are still being controlled together with Jabhat al-Nusra by Jaysh al-Islam and Akhra al-Islam. The leader of Jaysh al-Islam has been eliminated, Alush, Достаточно ясно высказывал идеологию этого движения. Я думаю, что современные средства коммуникации позволят вам найти в интернете эти он говорил, что нужно весь Ливан очистить от нечисти, от грязи, как он сказал. As he said, meaning Alawites directly, who, as he said, are even more disloyal than Christians and Jews. And he said that his brothers are Jabhat al-Nusra fighters who are fighting with against the common enemies. So these are the guys who are now around Aleppo, at least on the western part. On the eastern part, with our help, the government forces have already unblocked this city. And according to our data, those who are fleeing this area are fighters who are 
Мы не забудем, что все те, кто находится в Аль-Нусрам, и отдельные and other more moderate groups are being provided using the same route from one place on the territory of Turkey, so this factor should also be reckoned with since the UN Security Council resolution that was adopted before the resolution 2254 prohibits any supplies that support terrorist groups. Можете сделать вывод, что у нас с Джоном не все совпадает в оценках происходящего, и Именно поэтому еще раз скажу, что вот прояснение этих вопросов, как и многих других вопросов, ключевым является... Bear in mind, and let me repeat, I have no doubt that if what we have agreed upon today, and we have agreed upon contacts between military agencies, I, I'm convinced that practical issues will be dealt with efficiently, because simply saying without any foundation for five months that we are doing something wrong and refusing strongly to sit down using maps and look at facts is not an approach, it is propaganda. Propaganda was popular in Soviet, in Soviet times in our country. Right now we have abandoned this practice, but it seems that a lot of manifestations of such trends are still present in mass media in other countries. Probably we should put an end to this. And instead of pointing fingers at each other, we should realize that we have a common enemy and that all the concerns about one's image on the eve of election or with regard to some political events should be set aside and we should deal with finding solutions to problems which has become a truly existential problem for the, for the human civilization rather than just play geopolitical games. The next question will come from Vladimir Kondratiev from NTV. Vladimir Kondratiev, three company NTV Moscow. Vladimir Kondratiev, NTV company. I have a question to the Russian minister. Mr. Lavrov, will there be a continuance of the operation of Air Force forces of Russia in case a ceasefire is achieved? And will the agreements that have been achieved have an influence on the volume of this operation? You've also mentioned contacts during the creation of the International Security Group to determine during the areas of hostilities, does it mean that there will be a closer coordination of military agencies on the territory of Syria, which has not been the case so far, although Russia has been interested in this. And I have a question to the Secretary of State. Is it true that this coordination is the change of position of the United States with regard to Russia on the Syrian territory? As for the first part of the question, our documents read, and we've said about this, that ceasefire will not be extended to ISIL, Jabhat al-Nusra, and other affiliated organizations that have been recognized as terrorist organizations by the UN Security Council decision. That is why our airspace forces will continue working against these organizations as for the task force that is being set up to develop modalities and to further observe conditions of the ceasefire with the participation of the military. Yes, I believe that this will help to efficiently solve many issues and to avoid any discrepancies and misunderstanding 
наиболее важных результатов сегодняшнего дня. There is a track that is dealing with the resolution of the government transition under the Geneva process, and we need, similarly, a concerted effort to destroy Daesh. The fact of the commitment now to a cessation of hostilities, as well as the full implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 2254, which means full access for humanitarian assistance, mandates by common sense that if you're going to do that, you've got to be able to talk about the deployment of forces, the presence of people, who can go where, how they get there, and avoid conflict and coordinate, obviously, in ways that that are effective for the achievement of the UN Security Council resolution. And we believe that the full measure of that will be in what happens over the course of the next week, meeting the goals and succeeding in implementing this political process while simultaneously dealing with the problems of knowing what the various military factions and the various kinetic factions are doing on the ground so that uh, one can be effective and safe. The final question tonight comes from Isam Ikrimawi from BBC Arabic. Uh, Mr. Kerry, you spoke about um, the implementation of the, you didn't call it ceasefire, but uh, how much commitment have you got from Russia? Because we've seen over the last week or so, or two weeks, that the escalation and, and the air bombardment had led to the uh, humanitarian crisis when you have about 60,000 refugees massing on the border with Turkey. So how much of a commitment has Russia given you that it will de-escalate its uh, part in this uh, conflict. That's uh, the, the first question. Uh, the second part is about how much leverage does the United States have on some of the its allies in the region in order to persuade some of these groups who are not considered terrorist organizations by the U.S. to stop their um, participation in the hostilities. Well, um, I, I think really uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov ought to be answering the question about Russia's commitment uh, to uh, the cessation of hostilities. Uh, but I can just say that Russia <clears throat> said publicly at the first meeting of the ISSG in Vienna, and at the second meeting, and in New York, that Russia was prepared to implement a ceasefire. And today. And again today. And Iran likewise said that at the first meeting of Vienna and so forth. It was not Russia or Iran who stopped a ceasefire from being adopted at the very beginning. I want to make that very, very clear. And Stefan will agree with that, and our other ISSG members know that. So Russia has articulated a willingness to do this, uh, providing uh, that the other players are ready to enforce the full components of Resolution 2254 and then live by them. Now, that's another part of this mix. So um, I'm not here to vouch for anybody's word, uh, anybody participating in this. I said a moment ago, this will be measured by what happens on the ground. This will be measured by the steps that people take in the next days. And, and that's the true measurement, not the words on a piece of paper tonight or this morning, early. Uh, and I think everybody would agree with that. 
So we need to make sure this is fully implemented, and everybody has a responsibility to help do that. All the members of the ISSG committed to try to do that, including Russia, including Iran. Now, you'll be able to measure that as well as we will in the days ahead. And you ask about, about leverage. I, it's not a matter of, 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 you know, I mean, I suppose leverage here and there makes a difference, obviously. We all know that. But everybody engaged in this wants Syria to remain whole, to be peaceful, uh, and to try to resolve this conflict. But there are different opinions within that everybody as to how that might happen or as to what outcome they'd like to see. And that's the challenge here, I think. <laughs> I think the United States uh, has strong relationships within the ISSG. Uh, we have been able to uh, come up now with four separate communiques uh, in unanimous fashion with Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, Egypt, Qatar, uh, Russia, China, the United States, countries with different beliefs and feelings, all coming to the same logical conclusion, though they have different ideas about how the outcome might unfold at this moment. But the best we can do is continue to work in a collegiate fashion I don't think it's as much a matter of uh, leverage as it is a matter of common sense about how you end this war and, and whether one can end this war. As I've said previously, it is my belief and the belief of the majority of the members of this group that there will not be peace in Syria if Assad is determined to stay there and lead the country. That's our belief. Other people have a different point of view. But we don't believe you can make peace because we don't think that certain countries and certain players involved in this will stop fighting until there is a legitimate transition, which is what was decided in 2012. It's now 2016. In 2012, the UN and the countries that came together adopted the fundamental framework of what we're trying to do, which is a transition which allows the people of Syria to decide the future without coercion, without, uh, with, with, with full uh, participation, and, and that's what has been adopted in this process. So if everybody honors this process, uh, hopefully there can be a transformation. Uh, if they don't, there will be continued war. Since John said that it would be better for me to answer the first question, I will just reconfirm what we've already told you. You can read this in the document that was adopted today. To be more exact, that is that ISIL, Chapadal Nusra, and other terrorist groups that have been recognized as such by the UN Security Council do not fit the conditions of ceasefire. That is why, as we, and as far as I understand, the U.S.-led coalition will continue fighting this group. The most important goal is to make this ceasefire upon agreement between the government and the opposition. It is said directly, it was not, by the way, my initiative, for John's initiative, it was the initiative of one delegation, which John mentioned in different contexts. It was written down that the ceasefire could not be started immediately. It would start in a week if both the government and opposition elaborate all the uh, necessary uh, measures. Well, yes, probably some influence. We will have to put some influence on the Syrian side, and I hope that all will put this influence both on government and various groups in opposition. But let me repeat that terrorists are beyond this ceasefire. As for adherence, to agreements, our commitment, I would really like this commitment to be universal. I've already said that I agree with John that the, the best measure of our efficiency will be how 
the decisions that have been made will be implemented. So, in 2012, we adopted the Geneva Communique. I've already reminded that right after this communique was adopted, we convinced us as government to agree to work on its basis, and the opposition said that they would not work on this, that they were not satisfied with it. We brought this Geneva communique to the Security Council. Western partners rejected to adopt it, and it took us more than a year before the UN Security Council finally adopted this communique. And I don't want to look like someone who is trying to appease someone, but only when John took the position of the Secretary of State, we felt the wish to re animate to rehabilitate this agreement that had been concluded before John came to his office. But let us not forget that the Geneva Communique says that the principle of solving political problems in Syria is the agreement on transition provisions on the basis of mutual consent between the government and the whole range of the opposition. So if we are talking about commitments, about adherence to agreements, all these should be reconfirmed in a an integrated manner without emphasizing only just one word that there should be, for example, transition, meaning the change of regime by it. And this transition should be on the mutual consent between the government and the wide range of opposition. This thing is usually kept silent about. They believe that a delegation of opposition can be set up, which represents only a part of foreign opponents of the regime. Others can be turned into consultants. This will not work, and I'm convinced that this very clear mandate that is contained in the Geneva Communique and in the Resolution 2254 will be respected by our UN colleagues who play the central role in the political process. Thank you. That concludes tonight's press conference.